when we leave here, we want you to feel empowered, energized, and informed. And then we need you to you know, spread the good word to wherever you are. And that may mean spreading the word about what's going on here, first of all, because part of this is informing you. It also may mean spreading the word about the needs of the academy and then uh, spreading the word about how people can contribute if they so choose. So uh, hopefully you feel energized. Uh, we definitely intend to keep, make you uh, feel like an informed advocate. And as I said last night, with less than 1% of the country serving the country, a great part of this is making sure we're a great public relations advocates for the Naval Academy, what it represents, why it's an important investment, and what the midshipmen represent to the country and our graduates. So thank you for your time this afternoon. This is going to be a pretty efficient program today. I want to thank Major General Leo Williams, Class of 70, the Vice Chair of our Alumni Association, and uh, part of Dan Atkinson's great class for, for his time and his commitment. Leo and I have worked together for almost two decades now. Uh, for instance, the first time I joined the Foundation Board in 2004. Flown right by. Flown right by. And he has been a stalwart, uh, active volunteer and active participant and leader in our alumni association for just about two decades. And I want to thank you, Jane Williams, personally, on behalf of all of us for what you do. He's also the chair of our Joint Finance and Audit Committee, uh, the vice chair of our alumni association, and, and just a great uh, mentor for so many uh, young midshipmen and officers. And then, Mr. Eric Brookman, class of 80, you, we heard last, heard from last night, is the vice chair of our foundation board. He and I have also known each other for almost a decade and a half now. And uh, in his most recent role, Eric really ran the strategic uh, growth of the NFL in all the different uh, uh, places around the country and, and has been just a wonderful uh, supporter of the Naval Academy, he and Betsy, his family. And so Eric, thank you for your time this afternoon. And Eric is here and General Williams are here because they're gonna help lead this public phase of the campaign. John Williams is the vice chair of the Alumni Association, so he's gonna work with Admiral Locklear to really run our side of the alumni side of what we're gonna to do to get the word out to help lead the conversations and hopefully get around the country to different places and talk about it. Eric's the vice chair of our foundation, and he is really the person we uh, wanted to work with to energize the regions. And Eric's been to various regions, Texas, New York, and California for us, and you will get to know him because he truly is the leader of our regional effort. And so, appreciate their time today. After we're done, uh, John Rutter will lead a panel of great volunteers, and I appreciate all you guys being here, and John will introduce them. But this is a bit of a dialogue. I mean, this shouldn't be uh, kind of a one-way storytelling time, so if you feel like we're raising your hand to ask questions during any of our remarks, feel free to do that. It's more of a give and take. Uh, but we do have some things here, and by the way, people have asked me, hey, can I get a copy of this or a copy of that? Yeah. Wherever Kristen is, she'll get you a copy of anything that happened this weekend. She can make it happen. We can post it or get it to you. So, including today's, including today's slide. So I guess I gotta stay within range of this computer. So we're in my adventure hall here. Uh, I said this last night, but this is important, I think, for our alumni to understand. So I'm repeating what, what I said last night a bit verbally, but I'm going to give you the slides to take back with you about the history of philanthropy, because we often get questions from alumni as to, first of all, why you're raising money for a federal institution, and then secondly, what is this foundation structure that you have? It seems like a secretive organization of a few people, and we don't know what they do. So it all started with and Holloway, we, we ended up consolidating our organizations, both alumni and foundation, because at the beginning of the 21st century, and when I talked about philanthropy before this, in the 1940s, there's an athletic and scholarship program. Is Admiral Lynch here? Yeah, yeah Admiral, Admiral Lynch, yeah. So Admiral Lynch, who's here this weekend, and also gonna have a big meeting next week, got the handoff from Admiral Holloway to help run the athletic and scholarship program fundraising effort. And he's done a great job at it in this campaign and he's a strong advocate for the academy. But Admiral Holloway decided that, you know, having an athletic and scholarship group out here, an alumni association over here, and then a small drips and drabs structure of fundraising here and there among classes was not an efficient way to do business, nor was it a modern way to try to organize a very small uh, constituency. So, in his four-star way, he said, we're going to combine these and make this one of the envies of the country in terms of fundraising, advocacy for alumni, support for the Naval Academy, and support for athletics. 
And so he ultimately led the amalgamation that occurred at the beginning of the century. The amalgamation is that we have one group of people, myself and others on the staff who run the Alumni Association and Foundation, two boards, so related entities, both about 35 to 40 each, depending on the foundation board is now 40, alumni board is about 35. Different bylaws, but related entities uh, working together in the athletic and scholarship program works underneath the foundation as part of that continued effort. That amalgamation puts us in a position to talk like we're talking today. And believe it or not, I don't spend a lot of time on this structure here today, but it's really important for you to understand this because some people ask, well, the foundation is you know, not accountable to the Alumni Association or vice versa, we don't know how to make decisions. This amalgamated organization is the envy of higher ed. And the more we work together, the more the dialogues cross the organization so that you feel connected, the better we'll all be. So that's what this effort is today. And this campaign really is about us all working together to go forward. So it all starts with Apple Holloway's determination to make us the envy of higher ed. And we are, by the way, just so you know, West Point copied us after we did this. <laughs> Air Force is still trying to make it work, but they can't get along with each other. They have too many four stars who want jurisdiction and territory, so they have not been able to nominate like we have. They have a separate foundation with a structure of costs and whatever they do to try to raise money. They got a separate AOG with a structure of costs and whatever they do to try to raise money. They compete against each other to do that, and that's the death knell for any kind of cooperative effort. So that's why this is important. And here are the gentlemen that really implemented that, Apple Holloway's initial vision. Um, Admiral Ryan, I mentioned last night, uh, was suit, and then second chair of the foundation board, Admiral Larson, uh, was the first chair of the foundation board. And uh, David Dunn, who I did not mention last night, uh, started this whole thing with uh, what I call a six-figure commitment to the Naval Academy <coughs> Foundation to say, get something started that looks more professional than what you have today. So six figures to the Naval Academy through Admiral Ryan and Admiral Larson, six figures turned into 750 million. It's a pretty good investment over 20, over 18 years, really. It started in the beginning of the century. So as alumni, I need, as alumni leaders, I need you to know this story. Because we need to stop uh, the misunderstanding about how the foundation works, how it started, and then what it does for the alumni association. So David Dunn is the first anchor investor in the, uh, in the foundation structure we have today. And here are the suits that have been around since we started this effort. Apple Ryan, Apple Nott, Apple Rent, Apple Fowler, Apple Miller, Apple Carter, the bottom three have been part of this current campaign effort. We started strategic planning for this campaign in 2009. It's almost 10 years to the date, as of January, it'll be about 10 years since we started strategic planning. The strategic plan 2020 came into place around 2010, or so with the Navy and the second half signing off on it. And so the bottom three suits have all been stewarding that effort along with our foundation board and now the Alumni Association for almost 10 years. And here are the folks that also led the first campaign. Dan is here today. Dan, as always, thank you for your commitment. But Dan was here in the first campaign with Roger Staubach. So the first campaign, which Apple Ryan was suited at that time, uh, was led to try to build improvements to the stadium and other capabilities at the academy. But it was the first effort to figure out where the money could be raised from our alumni, which we're not accustomed to doing. So Eric Grubin was on the board at that time and a number of other people were on the board. I joined the board toward the end of that first campaign. And as Dan said to several people this weekend, the goal was 175 million, the ultimate result was 254 million. And at that time, that was a huge success for a place that had no history of philanthropy, that asked for no money from anyone when they graduated. And a lot of the answers, as Dan has said to people, is that when they went out to solicit gifts in that first campaign, people said, hey, I paid my taxes. What else do you need from me? I also serve. So we've come a long way since that time. But that was the proof and the pudding of the fact that we could, we could do this. Now we're in uh, a situation where we now know the Academy can use margin of excellence philanthropy on an ongoing basis not because of budget shortages, but because of what they need to do. And we've heard it all the last day and a half. So the current campaign is now led by Dan Atkinson as chair of the foundation board and chair of the campaign, Eric Grubman, vice chair of the foundation board and co-chair of the campaign, uh, Emma Michael Mullen, vice chair of the foundation board, and Ron Tewilder, co-chair of the campaign. And that's your foundation leadership. Again, I want you to know this so when you go out into the communities that you're in, you can explain who's who, and that'll be an important part of communicating 
uh, where we're going next and, and how we all relate to each other. And then in terms of building the culture on the alumni side, I mentioned this last night, but here's who I've worked with personally in the time I've been here, and Admiral Lynch has been a stalwart in the entire time I've been here as the head of the athletic and scholarship program. But the three alumni, four, four alumni association chairs have also been stalwarts. And Alma Trost, Abbott, uh, Matter, and Alma Lockyer are all leading, you know, what we call the alumni association side of the house. But at least over the last three chairs, we've all known we've been heading toward this campaign 2020. And so now we're integrated in our conversation as we go public and hand the baton off to many of you. It's very important you understand this leadership structure and how it all worked together before and now during this campaign. So with that, uh, I want to introduce General Williams to come up and say a few words. Are there any questions for me about this? Because I often get questions when I go around the country about who's doing what and why we're raising money for that and how does that help the Alumni Association? Any questions from what I've just talked about and how this structure works? Okay? Please welcome General Williams to the stage. Thank you so much. bottom of my heart for everything that you not only have done, but for being willing to take on what we are about to ask you to do. Let's uh, just for a few minutes take a quick look at what the history of philanthropy has been right here at the Naval Academy. In the summer of 1886, group of 12 Naval Academy graduates came together and formed what became known as the Graduates Association. They chose as their leader the oldest living graduate at that time. That gentleman is the guy pictured right there, Rear Admiral Edward Simpson, class 1846. Now, the Naval Academy Association was established in 1931 when the original Graduates Association, the one we just talked about, evolved to address the needs and provide services to both Naval Academy graduates and to non-graduates. The mission of the Alumni Association has not really changed since it was established back in 1931. But there have been minor adjustments, just tweaks, uh, that have been made uh, over the past several years, mostly in the way of the programs, the services, and the networking of alumni that have increased exponentially. The athletic and scholarship programs. Founded in 1944, known as the ASP, it's a division of the Naval Academy Foundation that encourages and supports athletic excellence here at the Academy. The ASP is responsible for grants and awards that recognize superiority in athletics and a comprehensive scholarship program that ensures that the Naval Academy has the very best scholar athletes in the nation. The mission is to promote athletic excellence at the Naval Academy through a comprehensive prep school scholarship program and through privately funded grants to athletes and physical development programs for which government funds either are not available or are not appropriate. Each year, the ASP provides over $2 million in direct support for all types of athletic activities here at the Academy. This includes financial support not only to the 33 varsity teams, but also to the club and intramural teams and the Naval Academy Prep School in Newport, Rhode Island. Through a needs-based scholastic program, um, the foundation, through the ASP, provides one year of post-high school education 
to young women and men who need to strengthen their academic preparation before they enter the Naval Academy. Thanks to the foundation's sponsorship, over 4,000 motivated candidates with excellent leadership, academic, and athletic potential have graduated from the Academy since 1944. It's a win-win, a real win-win for the Academy and for our outstanding scholarship recipients. The classes and what used to be called branches are now called chapters. Classes and chapters existed before 1938, as we say, the uh, Alumni Association um, most recently goes back to 1931. But it came into more structured role in supporting the Alumni Association with the launch of Shipping Magazine in 1938. Um, with Shipping Magazine, the classes and chapters could report out their activities and share information more broadly and efficiently. Today, the classes and chapters are the backbone of the Alumni Association. For more than 20 years now, the Alumni Association has encouraged and supported our parents' clubs. While traditional universities also support parent relationships, for the Alumni Association, this relationship has an even more special role. While USNA hosts parent weekends, and I say while the neighborhood can, Post parent weekends. It's the Alumni Association that takes on the day to day building and sustaining of relationships with the parents. A quick look at where those stand now there are 80 parents clubs, 3,200 parent alumni association members. In just one class, the class of 2022, there are 665 active parent members. There are 1,600 parent donors, 180 parent president's circle donors. And in just one year, last year, $1.4 million was contributed by the parents of midshipmen in that parents. Shared interest groups. Uh, this photo actually was taken uh, just a few weeks ago when uh, Navy played Notre Dame and uh, one of the uh, chapters of the women's shared interest group out in Oak Harbor, Washington got together to watch that Navy Notre Dame game. They were hosted by um, Linda, nicknamed Posty, Post and Rider out of the class of 1982. For those who are not familiar, shared interest groups are communities of alumni that actively communicate or gather around a common shared affinity and or bond based on shared experience and background beyond class year or class affiliation. They are all volunteer, uh, they are an independent organization, and they are aligned with the overall mission of the Naval Academy, of the Alumni Association, and of the Naval Academy Foundation. After a very rewarding year-long pilot program, the Alumni Association has now three shared interest groups. Those are USNA Women, Run to Honor, and the Naval Academy Minority Association known as NAM. We look uh, for the number of shared interest groups in both number and size uh, to grow in the years to come. Philanthropy has been a part of our legacy here at the Naval Academy since our very founding. Uh, alumni from the late 1840s raised funds for the Naval Academy's Mexican War 
monument. And about 50 years later, Robert Meads Thompson, out of the class of 1868, commissioned artist Evelyn Longman to take the bronze doors at the entrance to the Naval Academy Chapel. Efforts, efforts expanded in the 1940s with athletic funding through the ASP. But efforts were nominal in scope until the mid-1980s with the public-private partnership of Alumni Hall. An alumni effort raised $13 million to match federal funds to build that 6,500-seat multi-purpose arena. Then, in 2005, the Leaders to Serve the Nation campaign closed, having raised more than $254 million. And as Byron mentioned, that is an amount that blew the lid off of the campaign target of $175 million. Today, we're poised again to make history with the Call to Serve, Daring to Lead campaign. So, let's once again find a way to wildly exceed our every expectation. Go Navy, go Marine Corps. Hoorah! Right. Eric, you got the stage. Thank you, young fellow. Thank you, sir. I was going to start with a series of knowns and unknowns, but I'm going to go right to the known, unknowns, and right to the last unknown, because if I don't, I don't think I'll be able to get your attention to what I really want to say, because I think it's just after lunch. So here was the last unknown. I don't know anything about how footballs get inflated or deflated. <laughs> I don't think this is SCI, but I trust you, those comments are safe. <laughs> Here's two uh, real unknowns. I, I don't know the potential of the regional effort. You, you probably don't know either, but I bet you're a lot closer to knowing it than I do. The other thing I don't know is that I think is really crucial is how long will it take us to get the kind of participation rates in our alumni that other great schools have. Anybody know how many alumni we have? I think Tim Cavasco told me 60, 65, 70,000. Let's use 50. I was a new, so I'm not very good at math. Anybody know what the average, how many people here are Starbucks fans? What's the average spend at Starbucks per day per user? Five bucks. Five times seven is, I can do that, 35. You keep doing the math. One cup of Starbucks average cost for 50,000 per year is 250 of the annual fund. Per month, per week, per day. You can see where I'm going. It's not hard if people work it into their daily lives, either on a budget basis or it's just that tickler that says at the end of the year. Why is that important? So, so let me go to the, and, and Leo and, and uh, Byron have done it really well and talked about the history, but I want to frame it for you and why we're here, why you're here, and why the regional effort is important. Fifteen years ago, we had a very ambitious goal. It was a first time plan. Uh, it was to su success equaled funding the unmet needs. It branded the foundation. And most importantly, most of them, it proved that the foundation, which was the baby, could work alongside, which was with the Alumni Association, which was the parent, and also work alongside and meld well together with NAAA, which was, of course, did whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. The reality is that that was not a full long completion. It was absolutely not a foregone conclusion because NAAA was used to saying, no, funds can't go to X, they have to go to Y. Alumni Association was used to saying, we have this vital need, that has to come first. It wasn't until John Lyons said, 
look out in the future and project where we will be if we don't find them, that's a bad picture that the three came, finally came together. We raised a lot, was organized around a structure, as I just described, largely based in and around Annapolis. This campaign is a lot different. This campaign is about getting outside our comfort zones. Every one of us, more than one time in our military careers, have gotten out of our comfort zones. And nine times out of ten, when we got outside of our comfort zone, comfort zone even if it resulted in initial disappointment, even initial failure, <coughs> where we ended up was further than when we started. This campaign is about getting outside the comfort zone, beyond a centralized structure. Expand to friends, family, corporations. Begin to look longer than three to five years. This isn't about unmet needs that should have been funded 10 years ago. This is about, as Dan has liked to say for many years, it's maintaining good to great next to the competition that, let's, let's face it, they are always, always, always going to vast, vastly outgun us on wealthy graduates. Always. So we have to do more with less, but less is the time has a lot more money than we've had in the past. This goal is bigger. It's bigger in dollars and scope, I've already described. It's too big for the comfort zone. It's branding the academy beyond its alumni. Who, who was there last night? How many of those people that saw that video and saw those mids last night, if you were walking down the street and happened to go into a theater and catch that, or catch, caught a trailer, how many of you, not having, knowing anything about any academy in the world, would be inspired? I would, I would, I, would, I was inspired even though I thought I'd seen all that before. That was unbelievable, and if we can brand that, we can catch that magic in a bottle, brand it, and put it out there, good things will happen. The scope requires buy-in, which is much, much broader than what we had to do in the first campaign. What we had to do in the first campaign is Dan and Roger Spellback had to be sold on being co-chairs. A bunch of us had to sit around the table, take a very deep breath, and bite off the stadium. We didn't have the first dollar funded, and we didn't want maybe be all about athletics. But we had to we had to sit there and say, okay, you got to do the stadium because that's the calling card that we can be certain all of our alumni see every year. Even if they're not there, they're going to see images of it, and they're going to see the result of it when the Army Navy game starts. This thing needs the regions, and it needs regional leadership. Both of the phases are critical. I know there's one rugby player here. How many other rugby players here? Okay, it's all about phases. I was a rugby player, pretty lousy. Um, private, which in effect we ended last night. We moved from the private to the public. Everybody says, well, well you know, what's the big deal? Seemed like a victory lap last night. No, it wasn't a victory lap. It was the starting gun going off. Private is where we attack the effort that gets the ship moving. That's really what it does. It's a big ship. It's hard to move. Once it starts moving, it's going to move pretty good, and it's going to move for a while, but it's not going to finish. Only the public phase can get to the branding. Only the public phase can get to the broad audience. Only the public phase can get beyond 500 graduates or 1,000 graduates and get to 50,000 graduates and 50,000 <coughs> friends of graduates and 100,000 family of graduates and on and on and on. Only the public can do that. Here's my notes. Hundred thousand bucks. How many of you in this um, room went to a major institution at some point in your career other than the Naval Academy, grad school? Oh, so all of you are familiar with fundraising. How many of you either have had children or family members or have friends um, who have gone to elite private high schools? You know what I'm about to say. $100,000 will fund multiple Jonathan Downers. You heard his story from the stage last night. Every year, go learn the things that he learned and come back and proselytize here 
and in the fleet. $100,000 is not enough to fund Harvard's seasonal leaf peeping bike club. They spend so much money on things that we would never brand as vital. It's vital for Harvard and their student population. What's vital for Jonathan Denmark is to learn Japanese and for the Japanese to learn about Jonathan Denmark. Diversity, here's the thing I know. It's still a buzzword and a cudgel at institutions like Berkeley. I have nothing against Berkeley. But diversity used there is used as a term to drive political partisan, partisan arguments by both sides. Diversity here today is a way of life. Now, we don't get to it before, and we, we can't pat ourselves on the back and say, before anybody knows anything, we solve it. No, 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 that's not the way it works. But diversity is a way of life. Why? Because the sailors and the Marines are diverse, and there is no way that our graduates can leave unless they themselves understand that, and there's no way they can understand diversity unless they themselves are diverse and grow up with one another. One more known, millions in New York City are needed to get the best table at the annual gala. And you know what happens next year? You gotta put up another million, otherwise your, your table gets bumped to the back. That's enough to make a difference in the quality of leadership that comes out of the naval cabin, to fight for freedoms, and to bring more comrades home. Now, if I'm making that pitch, I would rather make that pitch for that million bucks out in the region to a, a graduate, a friend, or a family to wrap themselves in the flag of the United States of America as opposed to sit up in the front of the gala in New York City. I might not succeed, but I'll tell you, I feel a lot better and more impassioned about that pitch than I would the New York City pitch. So here's the deal, and then I'm finished. And I'm sorry for taking so long. You've got to leave with a way to remember. OK, ready? It's going to be really long. Everybody got their notes? Private. Gets it in the red zone. Maybe the wind is getting it in the red zone. Public. Gets it in the goal line. You guys have the ball. Well, thank you. We're ready to go. Uh, it was very inspiring. Uh, how many of you here are class presidents? How many of you are chapter presidents affiliated with parent organizations? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, you are the boots on the ground for us, and we appreciate all you do, and without you, all the rest of this would be much, much more difficult. And we're greatly appreciative of your support. We know that there are many, many thankless hours with what you do. And we are appreciative of your effort. I know often your constituency is, but there are plenty of times when they've got opinions that may be otherwise. Uh, but we appreciate all you're doing to facilitate uh, what we're, we're talking about today. The, the purpose of uh, our gathering today is that there are, as, as Eric outlined, we've had pockets of initiatives going on around the country where there are good practices, some better practices, some best practices occurring. And we'd like to share some of those stories with you, uh, share with you where appropriate, how the campaign dynamic has facilitated some of that, and talk about not just the next two years of the campaign, but a new approach as we go forward into the 2020s about how we may have an opportunity to fundamentally change the relationship between our alumni and our, and our alma mater. Uh, we are evolving as an organization. I think there's no greater uh, evidence of that when you look at the thoughtful effort put in regarding shared interest groups. Uh, they're a very passionate group of people. The, I mean, Craig, will talk, uh, Craig will talk a little bit about this when he, he comes out, but 
the growth in those organizations, the passion of those organizations, the commitment of those organizations uh, is stunning. And it's a real opportunity as we continue to evolve and think about our relationships, perhaps outside chapters, perhaps outside parents clubs. Uh, I'm not sure we'll ever change the structure of a class. Uh, they're uh, the bedrock of, of everything that, that we're associated with. But there's a real opportunity before all of us. And um, I'm excited for uh, our panel here to share some of that, some of their successes with you. With me today, uh, Commander John Dillon from the great class of 1972. And I'm going to give a very abbreviated, abbreviated version of their bios simply because they've got some good information to share and we don't need to hear about his very long distinguished career. Uh, John has been, for more than three years, the chairman of our Northern California Regional Campaign Committee. We stood up a group of 13 people comprised of graduates, parents, um, donors. Um, we've included Blue and Gold Organization, the chapters, uh, parents club leadership to build a cohesive unit out there. And I'm excited to share some of that and have John share some of that with you today. Greg Colandrea is the, from the class of 90, is the former president of the Dallas chapter. Many of you were aware of the Dallas chapter for many, many years has been one of our, our top performing, best led chapters and continue to sustain that. Greg was the chairman there, or the president of, of that chapter for a number of years, and now the trustee for the Dallas chapter. Murph McCarthy, class of 2000. Murph has been the president of his class during its entire existence. Um, and is currently the president of the Council of Class Presidents. George Agaro, class of 05. George is currently the president of the New York Metro chapter. In addition, he has played an active role in a regional strategy there as well and uh, has some, some dialogue and some ideas regarding some pilots that we're working in New York these days. And finally, Julie Foxton is here and she's representing our parents organization. Julie and her husband Ken ran the New York, uh, the Northern New Jersey Parents Club for a number of years. She is the parent of an 07, an 09, and a 12 graduate, and they now reside down here in, uh, in, the, in, in Annapolis. Uh, we would like this to be a uh, ask you to uh, raise your hand if you have questions at any point and stop us along the way. I would like to share one quick anecdote. Um, Craig Smith, who is here from the great San Diego chapter, uh, they were a wonderful partner for us a couple of weeks ago in San Diego. It was part of uh, a, a, an exciting present circle weekend, reunion weekend. We had 4,000 of our closest friends at tailgates, and, uh, and our partnership with the San Diego chapter uh, lent a great deal to that. But Craig was more enthusiastic about coming to this event because he had checks in his wallet from the chapter that he wanted to make sure they got recognition for it. He entered us a check for almost $1,000, the Athletics and Scholarship Program, almost $1,000 for STEM Outreach, almost $1,000 for uh, our Naval Academy, uh, our annual fund, and $1,000 for um, setting, to, to support the Naval Academy Summer Seminar Program. Craig, thank you. That's tremendous leadership. We, we truly value that part. And it would be unfair for me not to recognize that that is going on in other chapters around the country. We have this partnership is truly one that's growing and developing. Uh, Craig Washington and Joe Fagan and Elizabeth Bean are doing a tremendous job helping create that connective tissue between uh, regional efforts that are developing all over the country. And we're most appreciative for that. Now, with that said, um, I would like to ask this group talk a little bit about their specific programs and how they have evolved or grown since we kicked in the campaign effort sometime in that 2012 to 2014 range. John, can you share a little bit about our Northern California efforts? You know, we're a long way in San Francisco from Annapolis, and uh, I'm class 72, so I think I uh, predate so pre all you guys. Um, we were kind of orphaned out there in California. I mean, we didn't hang out in Washington. We didn't go to the Army Navy game. Um, if you didn't stay in for 30 years, you didn't do a tour <coughs> duty at the Pentagon and the like. And there's sort of this forgotten alumni association, this resource that was just sort of 
just below the surface. And what is really exciting for me, and I'm from San Francisco and been there since uh, I left the Navy, the Academy and the Foundation and its, its Alumni Association is really pulled together. We've got the Parents Club involved. We've got the chapter involved. Uh, Steve Hall's done a great job as a regional trustee. And essentially about 10 to 15 of us kind of pulled together and uh, said, look, we can do some really darn good out here in California. And we've got Northern California, which is it's a, the state's 800 miles long, so there's a big difference between Los Angeles, San Diego, and San Francisco. But we've got a big pocket of people in the Bay Area, I think about 1,700 graduates or alums. Um, and what we did is we started bringing yard executives out. We had the soup out twice. We had the commandant out. He gave a great talk. Um, uh, we've had uh, Captain Tortuga come out and talk about cyber. Um, we even had a couple of football games against uh, San Jose State. We're not playing them anymore, but uh, that would bring out a lot of interest. And that sort of attention from 3,000 miles away coupled with some determination, some really good support from, from again, the Parents Club, the alumni chapter, and uh, the foundation, we've really boosted our presence. I think, like I said, we've got 1,700 alums. It, since 2014, I think we've gone from 400 active donors to 1,000, and going, that's 150%. I'm a, I'm a nuke, and I can even do that math. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it's great. It's really gratifying. We're really pleased with the progress. I think, uh, I, I think we're probably at $10 million already or more, and I think we can double that before the campaign's done. So we're just really excited, and it's all the support that we're getting from back here in Annapolis. I will say that uh, there is, there is I, I, I'm from the North Texas chapter. Uh, and uh, Dallas-Fort Worth uh, and huge swaths of Dallas, or huge swaths of, te of Texas, it's a pretty big state too. Um, and we're blessed with a lot of graduates there. There's uh, 1,500, 1,600 graduates uh, in the area. Um, and we do a lot of things in the chapter. Uh, we, uh, we've always had uh, really good uh, lunch and speakers and uh, events and we pull in a special speaker every once in a while and we do things with our with our sister academies you know just join events but I'll say that there's 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 no draw that we can get in our chapter that is going to exceed what we would get when a yard leader comes to town uh, when and, and we uh, again, through an activity that we, a uh, homegrown activity in our chapter, we do a big candidate dinner every year to try and get these candidates who have the choice between Navy and West Point or Harvard or Stanford or MIT to go to Navy. And uh, we, we have historically always gotten either the superintendent or the commandant, or in some lucky years both, to come to Dallas for that. And we put 300 people in a room for that. And, uh, you know, 100, 125 graduates for that along with the candidates. And um, that level of activity has helped our chapter just grow dramatically. And, and since the, this campaign started uh, 2012 or so, uh, I, I would say that there hasn't been a big demarcation line between when it started, um, you know, the cha it was fairly invisible to the chapter, but we've doubled uh, the number of dues-paying alumni in our, in our local chapter over that period to just a tick under 500 now. These are 500 alumni who are paying uh, to become a member of the chapter because they see value in what we do. And the reason I say that is because what that gives us is that gives us the infrastructure to be able to support a campaign like this. Uh, and there, you know, there, there's, there's nothing better that we could do as a chapter than to be constantly communicating with the alumni in the area um, and you know, it feels like we've been doing a lot for the alumni for a long time, but now we're at the point where, okay, now you need us to support the, the campaign. All right, we've, we've got the plumbing in place to be able to do that. So uh, the plumbing is already in place with the classes. Uh, every, the big deal with the classes is the reunions, and uh, we kind of capitalize on that by having a class project uh, leading up to the reunion. So every year there's a new class that's uh, in the on-deck circle or in the hole to get their reunion done. 
and they basically sit down uh, with somebody at the uh, foundation, and then we find out what the strategic plan is and how what you know what the soup's looking, uh, what needs he wants filled, and the class president, the class leadership, uh, figure it out from there. A lot of times, it's socialized with the class, and you can do a, a survey or. Uh, whatever you want to find out that, and then you find out what, what resonates with your class and what doesn't, and then you pick it, and then it moves towards uh, the reunion like that. How does the campaign help? Uh, it's you know, it's kind of like when you're talking about uh, what works with leadership. Sometimes you got to throw a lot of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. I think with fundraising, there's that too. When, when you're already working on a class project, but you have the campaign, and we have you know the, these neat events, and there's people showing up in regional areas, and it's like you know. I've been about to give to my class project. You know, that, that thing we went to where the suit came and the not came, that was really, that was motivational. Uh, I was kind of re-energized by that. That's where the campaign typically has a shot in the arm for uh, the class projects. Murphy, could you, could you comment a little bit on uh, some of the younger class activities? So, um, younger as in, I think, I think the magic 2008. Number, 2008. So they started this uh, first gift program, which was genius. Uh, you know, when you come through plebe year and you, you sign up for all this stuff, you don't even know what you're signing up for. But they, as a class, they all agreed that they wanted to give a gift to the Naval Academy when they graduated. And four years later, they were like, yes, we we're giving a gift to our class. Well, it's kind of like we were talking about with the five bucks in the Starbucks. If everybody in the class that graduates gives 2008 cents, here we are three months later, that adds up. and. Throughout their term, five years later, that turns out to be a lot of money. So the classes in that way, they're doing the first gift campaign. That's really been a, uh, a force multiplier for the um, uh, for the fundraising. And then as the campaign starts, you know, those, when those guys get to five years, you know, they, they might get out, they might not, and they're trying to think, well, I had my gift set up when I was on active duty, but now I'm on active duty, so I should really go ahead and set that back up. So that's a just as a point of reference, the, uh, the first gift programs have uh, generally participation rates well more than 50 percent. And uh, you know, having been in a class that just provided a gift at their 40th reunion, you know, we were more in that neighborhood of you know, in a campaign, in a as part of a class project, you know, in the low 30s. So uh, the idea of first gift has really uh, it's been uh, very very helpful. We actually stole that idea from West Point uh, several years. Um, I was actually planning on wearing a tie too, but Eric told me not to, <laughs> so I realized it's set up now. <laughs> okay. um, so we've actually had a pretty good partnership with the fundraising campaign. It kind of lined up directly with the chapter trying to just really be established. We hadn't done very much in New York City. There's a lot of competing interests, so to get people to show up to anything when we weren't doing very much proved uh, pretty difficult. So we were really trying to ramp up just things we were doing to get people engaged. We started off with social things, like just our the football game watch, which is every weekend, get people like at bar that's owned by the alum. Um, and they're just gonna put the games on, put the sound on. It's a Saturday afternoon, no one was showing up anyways to their bar. So if 15 grads show up, great for them, and it'll win for us. Um, so we were doing things like that. Um, then we started a speaker series, or I got a speaker to come, so I got Montel Williams to come. And then um, in conjunction with the campaign, we figured it would be beneficial for all of us if we did things together. So for the Montel, for Montel, there was the alumni chapter, public piece, but then we did a private, you know, a private portion uh, in a room. We just had a law firm, also a grad, a grad provided the space, and then it was just uh, donors or people of interest or, you know, in the, in the area got tied with Montel by themselves, right? Um, and then other things that we're doing as a chapter, I would just loop in, you know, to Ted Jeffries or or Bill and others um, from the from the campaign, just to say, hey, we're planning on doing this. Do you guys want a part of it? So, like, our our Navy basketball was playing in Madison Square Garden. We're going to do a, a game watching, and people were going to the game. The fe the foundation got the soup to come, so it kind of legitimized us and made it seem like I did something, but I didn't really do anything. Um, <laughs> And for the chapter, it's, I mean, it's been immense for our chapter just because the things that I would do by myself um, as part of the chapter 
would not be as big or as grand getting the foundation involved. And obviously, they're trying to build their presence in the, the New York area. We're trying to build our presence. So it's been very beneficial. And they had things that they were planning on doing. So they had you know, with the, uh, leaders from the yard coming to New York City. So then we would build in the chapter component of that and say, and invite people from the chapter to join. So we've had a, we've had a really good two-way street. I think that we've all benefited. I've probably benefited more. But um, in, in general, I think it's a, it's a good way for other other chapter leaders to think about if you're planning on doing things that you think are pretty cool. And we're trying to be, I think I said, because we have a lot of competing things in New York, we're trying to be pretty thoughtful and uh, unique about what we do. And uh, there's just been good ways to loop the foundation and all that. Hello, my introduction to the military was when I became a parent of a Naval Academy midshipman. In Jersey, we, um, I can't speak recently to what they're doing, but I know that when we were presidents, we would loop um, together with the chapter. Uh, Pat Hurley is here, he ha is now gonna be taking over that, but we would do games at Summit. We would have uh, two dinners a year, the Commandant came to speak, we had um, Colonel Ar Ar Arthur Ashed, we had um, a number of individuals. We would have it on the shore, and then we would have it over at 95, so the first East could come up. And we would always invite the chapter if they could come and visit with us because we found midshipmen wanted to speak to people who were going, who had done it, who were out there, what they were going to be doing, what it looked like. And it was very helpful for parents also to have that. We found that we were speaking to a lot of parents who had never been part of a military. They didn't, the military, they didn't know. So they wanted to have that conversations with individuals. And then they wanted to know how they could help. Where could they put their money? What would be beneficial? And then that was a way for us to find a way into helping with funds being raised. Uh, Julie, could you comment a little bit, and, and I know Craig will talk about some of this, but, and I, I'd be interested in, during the campaign, a lot of effort has been put in to reachability and, and its impact in terms of communication with the, the parents' clubs, and certainly, I think that's probably true with the chapters, and, and classes as well. Sure, one of the great things that the foundation has done is they've really done a great job of reaching out to the parents clubs and getting the information out there. In the beginning, we found that there wasn't a whole lot of ways for us to like see our children. So they put photos up, they support them with websites, they have, um, they talk now to about 84% through emails and newsletters, and they have parents signing up all the time to see their children. I am not a helicopter mom, but I know a lot of, of them that are, and they like to pay attention. They like to know where their young men and women are and what they're doing, sometimes to a fault, but it's important that we keep that communication open. Um, the foundation also provided good governance for clubs, for parent clubs, and for ways of helping and setting up structure setting up 503C organizations so they knew where their money was going. We were fortunate in Jersey. We stood on the shoulders of some great individuals that came before us. We had that in place. All we did was build on it. Yeah, we, we really tried to just go as broad as, as possible. So first it started with obviously just the email things to the alums. I actually had to build a separate database because people don't go back into the, the alumni association directory and update their addresses. Um, so as we've done things and we invite different people, they'll you know ask me to add them, and I tell them to go into the system. Um, but anyway, so we, you know I've built a separate database of people to reach out to, and then we've done a lot just trying to partner with um, the parents association, with the blue and gold officers in the chapter there, and that's and that's been great. It's, it's and also in con conjunction with the fundraising campaign, um, for example. Cantor Fitzgerald is a parent um, who is, is pretty senior there, and they have this fundraiser, uh, a celebrity fundraiser, and then we got David Robinson to come and do that, that fundraiser. Um, so we've been, as we've been branching out to do things with the parents, with Bloom and Gold Officers, I mean, I'm getting, I got a call from a chairman at this one of the 20 private schools Eric was talking about, about trying to get um, us to the BGOs to go, and they, they said no one, they said, you know, 40% of the kids that I believe, they said none in their history to any of the academies, right? So just as, but as we branched out and started to do more with parents and, and other organizations, on top of the alums, not to mention we do a lot of things joint with 
West Point Society and with other veteran organizations, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, um, the Navy League, you know, because there's these organizations have a lot of overlap, and a lot of alums are members of these organizations, but they don't know we exist because they're not in the email distributions. So I found that as we, as we started to branch out across organizations, just thinking about who, you know, where the overlap is, we capture a lot of grants that way too. Email, switch to comment on that. I think uh, comms, communication, people's information, I, it's like channel camouflage, it's continuous. You have to constantly keep getting people's information. It's never ending. If there's a, a silver bullet for any class president or any organization, it would be like, how do, we, how do we stay in contact with people? And the answer is you just have to keep transmitting, you know, because some people think Facebook is the devil and some people are really into it. But if you don't put anything out on there because some people aren't into it, you're going to lose all those people. Email lists. And uh, I learned, uh, you know, I'm not quite a millennial or anything, but I learned about a new app that I'm not using and I should be, the Slack app yesterday. I'm like, oh, sweet, there's another thing I gotta figure out. Um, but that's that's the way of the world. These new things are coming around constantly, and some people are in one lane and they don't look at anything else. You just, it's like a constant chase your tail with cops, but that's just part of the deal. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll second that. It's uh, just, uh, uh, so the, the North Texas chapter has uh, a website platform. Uh, we kind of we kind of went off platform from what uh, the alumni association offers us, just because we had a pretty good set of needs and more importantly a really good set of talent to be able to manage that. And we did that uh, back when I first got involved in the chapter, and about ten years, nine ten years ago now. And uh, that platform has evolved. It's a cloud-based platform for managing alumni chapters, and it has evolved zero. So we're looking at the next one. So if we're going to go to the next platform that we want to use, we want to get the most up-to-date information for everybody. And going through and cleansing, I mean, I'm a CIO for a living, and going through and cleansing your data is, is worse in our chapter, I think, than anywhere I've ever seen. We have people who have three different accounts because, well, I forgot my login and the email that I used. And all that. I mean, it, it's, it's just a mess, and then all that's different than what uh, we have here uh, in the central database at the Naval Academy. So Craig, at some point I'm gonna come to you and say, you know, here's the Venn diagram of all the people that we have in our database, and all the people that you have in your database, and here's the ones where they're identical, and here's the ones where we think they updated our database more recently than they updated your database, and, and vice versa. So it's a constant challenge, but, um, we still send out about 50 email newsletters a year to our data, to our to our chapter, and that's about one a week. And um, we have 65% open rates on those things, uh, and really good click-through rates on those, and really low unsubscribe rates on those. So while we're omniture, trying to at least be multi-channel through, we have a Facebook page, a Twitter account, and some other things, we probably won't hit slack. But um, uh, so I applaud you for that. But, uh, no, it's not great, but um, uh, the email works. And, you know, that's how people sign up for things. This big dinner that we do every year, uh, we have been online with that for about the last five years. And in the second year, we got to substantially more than 50% of our registrations and donations through the website and online um, than we got through paper and people sending in checks. So. People are paying attention through whatever channel they want. You just need to broadcast on that one. Um, as we think about the next couple of years and on into the, you know, into the 20s, um, could you comment on things that you think the campaign dynamic may help enable? I know we've got a couple of pilot programs in, that we're working on in both New York and in Northern California. John, could you come on comment on that at all? Well, I think we got momentum. It's on our side. I've not seen it like this before. I mean, just look at this event. I mean, I, this is so much, it's amazing. I mean, you guys have done a great job bringing us up to date. We're all advocates. We're all cons in the same conspiracy and bringing in, in the house and seeing what you guys are doing is great. And I did love that video last night. I forgot, but it was great. Um, we can't let the momentum die just because we finished the campaign. 
Um, when I think about what's happening in the Bay Area, I actually feel part of the Naval Academy Alumni Association once again, and there was a big desert there for a long time. I don't know how we necessarily, or what we might want to do to kind of keep the activity, but even if we're not fundraising, which I suspect we always are, but even if we don't have a campaign, we shouldn't let this die out and then have to rekindle it. So that would be my advice, and I'm, I'm fully prepared to support that in California. John, could you comment on, we've got a young alumni initiative that we're, we're working on. Could you comment a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we've got a, a new young man out in the West Coast as sort of a foundation. Yeah, Frankie's our gift officer. Frankie's a gift officer, but he's, he's I, I told him I built a lot of sales organizations in my life, and I said, listen, you're going to have to make your own news if you want to be the number one guy, and he's doing it. He's picking up the phone. He's not afraid to call anybody. He doesn't take no for an answer. He calls back, and he calls back again, and he calls back again. I love it. I want to hire the guy, but I'll leave him with John um, until the campaign's over, of course. Um, but, but the point is, first of all, he's a lot younger than a bunch of old blue and gold officers and some of the old alums, and he's reaching out to these people. We've got a really vibrant tech community with tons of uh, tech guys. We find a way in there. California's got 40 million people. We put a lot of guys from the Naval Academy. They don't all stay 30 years in the military career, and they're just hidden everywhere, like Easter eggs. And, uh, what Frankie's doing, he's putting together kind of a young graduate campaign. We want to bring in early. We want, we want young men and women that are maybe only five years, two or three years out of the service. We want to capture them, give them a program that makes it exciting, and meet small groups. And there's a lot of networking opportunity that if you look at things like the Harvard Club or the Stanford Club or the Yale Club or whatever, they do a much better job of that than we historically have, especially for the graduates that don't make a 30-year career out of the Navy. And Frank is tapping into that. It's looking real exciting. We've got a couple of good events coming up soon. And I think those are going to be the big donors 10 or 20 years from now. So that's part of keeping it alive, and I think it's a good initiative. Yeah, so uh, also in conjunction with, so I'm a member of the regional uh, campaign committee, which is effectively a, a group, a small group of people um, who have gotten together to try to help you know, with the, the campaign in the New York region. and. Through that, we kind of formed a subcommittee of which uh, I'm responsible as spearheading as the literal and figurative George of the group. Um, and, and where it's going to be, you know, similar to uh, even stealing from San Francisco a little bit, but for us, it's going to be a Wall Street alliance, right? And um, there are a lot of other schools, organizations. As Eric mentioned, a ton of us went to other schools. I went to Penn. The amount of stuff that they do and how well orchestrated their fundraising events and things are, the dinners and so forth, there's no reason we feel like we can't do it. So a subcommittee formed from this uh, regional fund uh, campaign group, um, where we're going to start with just one subset. We know there are a lot of finance and Wall Street people in, in New York. I happen to be one of them. So it makes it easier to just aggregate forces. Um, the, everyone is really motivated, right? I think people are excited that the Academy is there and that there is an alumni association that's active again. And the goal is really just for us, we're, we're brainstorming on just getting the, a dinner, right? Just a dinner, because we have nothing, I mean, we do a holiday party, but you know, it's, it's nothing like what Dallas does, right? So our goal is just to start with this subsect and just get a, get a dinner of 25 people, we'll be happy. and. We have a few templates from other, you know, great schools who have, have done similar things, and it can grow rapidly. And in the some, I think Notre Dame, they started something similar. Within five years, they had 500 people at the dinner. So that's kind of what we're starting, just getting something going. And um, you know, we're in the very early stages, but big, big dreams. Greg, would you care to comment on, you know, the, the next two, three, four years as as part of the campaign dynamic? Well, we want to use the campaign as a vehicle to drive further engagement among the alumni in our chapter. So that's sort of the opposite message of what you know Bill O'Connor wants to hear. Uh, I, I know it's not, but it's uh, uh, you know the campaign for us. Uh, look, you're in a, you're in a chapter, and you're in, a, in, in chapter leadership. Your goal is to put alumni together in a room whether it's watching a football game, or at a dinner, or at somebody's house, or in a bar for a happy hour. Um, I'm a proud member of the class of 1990, um, but I have far more interaction with alumni from all different classes through my chapter than I do with my 1990 guys. And I think that's true 
for in almost every case. I mean, any any chapter that that does you know has any sort of level of activity is going to have a lot more opportunities for face-to-face -face interaction than what a class is going to be able to do. And that, that's, I mean, I'm a proud member of the class of 1990. I love it. And I'm on the Facebook page for 90 all the time. And, and you know, we email things out in that class, and, that, and that's fantastic. But um, any vehicle that we have, whether it's bringing yard leaders down to Dallas, whether it's... Uh, we love it that we get to see uh, Navy football at least every other year come to SMU uh, in Dallas. Um, or whether it's a campaign, it's a vehicle for us to be able to put alumni together. Because when you do that, invariably what happens to us, what we find is that, you, you know, we always ask for the raise of hands of who's here at, alumni, at this alumni event for the first time, you know, who hasn't been involved. And you get a lot of people. Well, those people keep coming back. There's, you leave the yard, you put the, the chapel dome in your rear view mirror, you go out to the fleet, you go out to the Marine Corps, and you do stuff, and you forget about this place for a while. And then when you come back and re-engage, for most people it sticks. And uh, if that campaign helps us do that locally, well, it's just a very symbiotic relationship between what the grads get from being part of, of this brotherhood of Naval Academy alumni uh, and, and how we're able to support it through things like the campaign. Yeah, I would certainly want to comment that uh, our, our, our experience in Northern California has, to be as, has, to, has been to be as complementary with all of the very, various constituent parties as we can. And very fortunate in that the chapter out there is well run, though it's a challenge because of difficult geography for the chapter. It's a great parents club out there and has been for many years. And so, when we came in, it was an offer to say, we are going to be doing this, and we want it to be complimentary. And so, you know, last November, we brought Paul Tortora out to visit the Northern California, to visit Northern California, but it was too close to the Army-Navy Watch Party, and they didn't want to cannibalize that for the chapter, so they chose not to go. That doesn't mean that those people weren't invited. It just, they, just, they didn't host the event. Um, and the same been, has been through whether it's parents' clubs or, or other affiliations. And likewise, we incorporate the Lone Gold officers to, to the activities as well because we want, you know, our belief is that an engaged, knowledgeable alum is going to make a difference in whatever role they choose to activate. And long term, that benefits fundraising as well. The more you know about what's going on here, the more excited you are to participate in some way, and that's what, what we're trying to do. And in the case with, with New York, um, George has been a one-man band, and so he's needed a lot of help, and so we're happy to help him in any way. And he has embraced that uh, more fully because he needed the help, and, and so we're excited about uh, we're excited about where this comes so far. Uh, Murph, do you have any comments regarding that? Uh, uh, random, a little less geographically based. Yes, but uh, random thought because I think there's a lot of people in volunteer leadership roles with chapters, regions, uh, whatever. That the first thing on their mind when they got this gig was not, was probably not how much they're going to make uh, with this new job. And the other thing was, uh, um, you know, I'm not a, really a fundraiser. It's just when you end up being in a uh, position of leadership with your chapter, or your region, or your class, you're a fundraiser. So uh, what does that mean? Essentially, be good at engagement and be informed. So all the stuff we've talked about, adding events, making sure they're well run, and a lot of people are in the leadership spots they're in because they thought the events could have been well run for next time. But when it gets to the fundraising part, just keep that going about the engagement and be informed. I mean, you don't have to memorize a whole manual to be informed about fundraising. All you have to do is talk about this place and the last time you were there and the things you saw, like in the video. I mean, uh, Mr. Atkinson last night, he's like, uh, federal funds get us to be a good college. Your donations get us to be a great one. That's pretty simple. I think you could probably end on that one and you'd be good, in good shape. Um, and then, you know, uh, little stuff like that, because everybody's got their excuse, and all you have to have is little fallbacks for the excuse matrix. And these, you know, these are your chapter mates, these are your classmates, you've had beers with them, you've heard them. Just be ready for those, and just be good with the engagement, and you'll be in good shape. Julie? Um, 
I also see that the campaign can further by embracing the parent branch and explaining how supporting their children at the academy through the extra funds is actually supporting their children as they go out into the fleet and become better leaders. I think that the parents can continue to be involved once their children leave here and they're a wonderful funding source. And I think again, it's just making sure that they're in the know. Um, people like to know what's going on. Um, I, I, I think we'd like to open up to any questions that any of you might have. So I'm going to, uh, I'm supposed to have closing remarks after this is done, but I had a question come up for me that uh, I thought would piggyback on what Cindy just said. The question that somebody presented to me quietly in the shadow is, well, what's your ask of us today? And I think you've heard this, but the ask is best practices in your chapter classes. These folks all have that information. Uh, be informed, as Cindy just said, we have information sheets, and Craig's going to talk about that. Uh, get comfortable with the Academy campaign priorities that remain and what you can do to, to participate. You may want to do that yourselves first to see if there's anything that makes sense for you, and you have a lot of great staff to do that. And then, these folks really represent what we're hoping for. Parents club coordination in your area, regional coordination with folks like John and others in your area, and stay in touch with the foundation staff. We would love to see, as Greg or someone said, or George, more dinners that bring people together, and if we can help you do that, great. More watch parties, Blue Angel show down here, football game watch parties. It all starts with something like that to aggregate people. But in the next two years, we want to help you grow your membership. You talked about that. We want to raise money. We want to raise money. Could be five bucks, could be two bucks, could be a buck. And want to get more parents and alumni connected and friends in your area because ultimately the measure for success will be funding, which we think will be one element, but as important is growth of your chapter, health of your chapter. George and George and I connected on this many moons ago. He's not here by circumstance, he's here, he's here because I knew him. And we engaged, and ultimately he engaged personally. Now look at him, he's up here and he's joining our alumni board. It is about reaching out to people. It's about generational handoffs, frankly. When I've been here as the national president, I've had chapters call me who said, I'm tired. Can you find somebody to be the chapter president? I'm like, well, where are you located? I'm down in Timbuktu. I said, well, how long have you been chapter president? For 40 years. I said, well, okay. And you're calling me now because you're tired and you don't want to do it anymore? Okay, we can't, we can't end up with that kind of dynamic. So Craig's going to talk about this, but we actually need to make sure that you've got a plan for generational connection and generational handoff. It's really important. We saw that in the panels today. Think about it. 90s and 80s panels. Very few 60s and 70s folks on panels. That's where we are. We're handing things off. So generational handoff, big events in your area, get used to fundraising, small, small D, big D, doesn't make any difference, and the growth of your membership. Just to get specifically to what Byron just left on, what would be the marching orders uh, for the public phase of the campaign? Firstly, uh, let me just say why we go public. That uh, in the quiet phase of the campaign, we were always clear we're quiet, not silent. That I've been at the Academy now almost seven years. Every time there was an alumni board meeting or we went out into the regions, we spoke of the campaign. Um, but when you take a long-term effort, uh, so much of a campaign, the public phase is driven by communications. You know, with private, the quiet phase, you really focus on individual big donors trying to get the big wow gifts to gain momentum. In the public phase, you have to manage outreach to 60,000 alumni. We have tens of thousands of parents, so we have about 100,000 constituents we need to reach. And when you have to reach people, 
uh, that broad and, and wide is a communications driven effort. And if you have a communications message for seven years, eventually you stop listening to it. So when we go public, it is really throwing open the door. So every time you read shipping now, every time you get advertised or any of our communications, we're going to be talking about the campaign. And I hope it will be a lot more toler tolerable for an 18-month period instead of um, a seven-year period. So. Um, the public phase also, it's important to, to reiterate what has been said before, it's not an event. It is a series of events, a series of activities that we invite people not only to uh, participate in donors of the campaigns, but to strengthen the alumni chapters, the parents, clubs, and we hope come together more solidly as an organization. So uh, I'm going to talk about what the foundation plans are specifically for the next 18 months. Craig is going to partner then to overlay what, how the alumni chapters will overlay to that plan and Kristen will show how communications is going to that, uh, the whole thing. So firstly, uh, Byron mentioned that we had a series of launch events. I'll go to much more about the future than what is now past. From the foundation point of view, we have three areas and we have regional committees. Uh, John Dillon leads uh, the committee in Northern California. Walt is part of our leadership team in Texas, and George O'Gara is part of our leadership team in New York. So in those three areas, uh, we specifically have fundraising committees that we meet regularly, and they help us drive the activity that's based in those regions. And I will emphasize that while we definitely have a fundraising focus to that, I think that we have worked very well with the alumni chapters and the parents clubs to integrate activities so that we're developing really comprehensive regional models rather than just building even more silos. Um, for those of you who are familiar with college and university fundraising and alumni relations, most schools still are very siloed. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of alum alumni associations and foundations of the same institution that are actually in competition with each other. The really good schools, the very few, the elite, are finding that the more you blur the line between what's alumni activity, you know, a silo and fundraising silo, the more you blur the lines respect you know, individual missions for both, but nevertheless blur the lines, coordinate the activities, the more all ships are rising in that scenario, and that's what we are attempting to do in the public phase of our campaign. So in addition to those three areas where we have formal committees, we have major gift officers spread even wider uh, uh, across the country. So whether we're up in New England around Boston, whether we're in the Med Midwest around uh, Chicago, whether we're in Colorado around Denver, whether we're down south in both Florida as well as Atlanta. Southern California is a big territory for us. Although we do not have formal fundraising committees in each of those areas, we have a very consistent formal presence in each of those areas. And I think that in many of those instances, we have kind of an informal leadership that we look to to generate activity in each of those areas. So in the coming 18 months, really, what we have done in New York, Northern California, and Texas, we're going to build upon, and we hope to replicate in other parts of the country. So the goal of our effort in the public phase is as much about the future as it is about the present. So when we stop counting gifts on June 30th, 2020, we hope that certainly we already have good models in New York, California, and Texas. We hope then that in some of these other areas, we've matured more in working with the different volunteer groups across those institutions so that when we get to the next campaign, and it will be a next campaign with a next strategic plan, we're going to have a much better baseline of alumni leadership involvement, parent leadership involvement, and the foundation all working in sync so that we go into the 2020s. Uh, we'll build upon those models and strengthen ourselves um, even more. So with that, I'll turn it over to Craig. Oh, Kristen, sorry. I, I was really glad that Bill mentioned, oh, first I should say, hi, I'm Kristen Peronas. I think I know pretty much everybody in the room, but if not, um, really good to meet you, and I'm really thrilled that you're here. Um, 
I was glad Bill mentioned that the public phase of the campaign is really about marketing and communications. It's when you take it from those one-on-one -on -one proposals and those one-on-one -on -one interactions to one-on-few and one-on-many. And that's where chapters, clubs, and classes really come into play. It's also where our mass marketing tools, like Shipmate, come into play. So what I'm going to do is I have three slides. So I'm going to tell you, bottom line up front, I will be quick. Um, three slides, and I'm going to tell you what we're doing at the Alumni Association and Foundation to support the campaign and what that campaign dynamic means for us in our work. And then in each of those slides, I'm going to talk about what that means for you and your role. So what that means for you as leaders where you live and serve. So first, shipping. Um, a couple years ago now, it seems like it was just yesterday, probably to you too, we redesigned Shipmate. The reason we redesigned Shipmate is one, you need to do it every couple of years, meaning every decade or so, because you need to make sure that it's updated for the younger generation, but also not alienating the people that are your base, you know, the people back from the 30s and 40s. I, I do want to say that had we had a president, because I'm going back to Leo's slides, um, Admiral Keats, class of 35, if we were to use that old method, he would be the president of the Alumni Association right now. And that would be pretty awesome because I don't know if you've met him, he's a former gymnast. Like, yeah, and he would be fantastic. He's a, he is the president of his class, the secretary of his class, the treasurer of his class. He has a class of one, and he's amazing. Um, yeah, he had, a, he had a reunion, a 75th reunion. Yeah. We were all there. <laughs> But it was fantastic. So a campaign in a box would have been super easy for that event. But anyway, back to the point. Um, I'm, it's late. I think we're all a little tired. <laughs> so Shipmate. Uh, we redesigned it so it would be an easier read for all of you. We wanted to make sure it was still relevant because it is an expensive proposition. So we worked with a number of you in the room to make that a better publication. So thank you for that effort. What that means now for you is you have a better way to tell your story. We, can, we know a number of stories. It's going to keep us in business for a very long time. You are our roving reporter. So when you have events, when you do things in your chapter or your class that are noteworthy, we're going to give you space in the class and chapter columns. We give you extra space. Sandy's here. She works with all the class secretaries, or chapter, half the classes, and all the chapters. Are you odd or even? I'm odd classes. Odd classes. That's how we think of you. Odd and even. Something to think about. But what, what, they've done, they, what they've done is every single time somebody asks for an extension of 500 word, 100 words, Sandy has never said no. She might cut back a little if you go over like 550, but she's going to work with you. So Shipmate is there for you to tell those stories. We also recently, in September, updated our website. It wasn't that it was done in September. We worked on it quite a while with all of you and, and launched it in, in September, right as we started to go public with the campaign, because we've been doing this for a while now. Um, what that means for you, and I think Steve is in the audience, we will give you a package to be able to, so that you can use that framework on your website. So this is a tool for you as much as it is for us. I was informed yesterday that there's a little bit of a glitch with our deployment, so we're going to work on that next week. All right, we talked about a lot about a campaign dynamic, and one of the things that we were able to do that we've never been able to do, not in the last campaign, not in our 130 year in history, is we actually, whoops, I went too far. We bought advertising. And we paid other people to place our ads. So if you go through BWI right now, you're going to see those ads. And a lot of people are seeing them, so much so that the admissions department is considering advertising exactly how we've done it. Not only have we done advertising at the airports, we've done it on some cable network channels, which is great. And we're doing it, and I, I really love that Eric mentioned like a preview or a trailer. When you go to an Annapolis theater right now, if you go in there and you see those 15 second trailers, our campaign video is one of those. So it's really neat. And one of the reasons we did that is to broaden that audience. So we want midshipmen to see that. We want them to be really proud of what they're doing. We want the local community to know what they're doing. And it's a really great way to sort of broaden the message without a lot of dollars spent on it. So without a campaign dynamic, we wouldn't have done this. And without generous donors who funded a campaign fund, we wouldn't have been able to do this. But going back real quick to what that means to you, and that's what I, at least I promised you that I would do that with every slide. What that means to you is it helps you tell the story where you are. People are going to ask you about the Naval Academy. You all are the voice of the Naval Academy where you live, much more so than we can be. So our job is to make sure that you're informed. Our job is to make sure it's a strong brand. Our job is to make sure that you're able to represent the Naval Academy. The last bit is events. So obviously for anybody who, who's been here the last couple of days, we've been a little busy with some of these things. I'm so glad that you're all with us right now. I hope that you're going to go to the pep rally and then the game after that. If you need tickets, let me know, because I think we have a couple extra. 
We started in the fall really branding our events so that if you went to a tailgate game, you, or tailgate prior to a football game, you saw the banners. If you were out in San Diego, you saw the banners, you saw the signs, you saw the energy. We are talking about things in a different way when we go to the events now. Craig's gonna talk about it, but we wanna help you brand your events too. Um, one thing that somebody asked me about is, what sort of assets are we gonna have from what we've done this, this week? Because not everybody in our alumni base was able to attend these events. Every single panel, every single event, every bit of this has been recorded, and we're gonna have a package put together so that you can download all of those. In addition to that, the video from last night will be available next week, and that'll be on the page that Craig's gonna mention, but there's a 15 second spot, a 30 second spot, and a five minute spot. And all of that can be just downloaded on a website, but also on a campaign in a box. So I know it was a lot of information very quickly, but we were trying to wrap up by three so you could all rest a little bit <laughs> before the game. All right, we're nearing the end. That makes, that, that's me, I'm, I'm nearing the end here. So um, Craig Washington from the class of 89, we've been, we've getting a lot of uh, shout outs here today with uh, members up on the panel and uh, it feels good to have our number get thrown out there a few times a day. Um, for those of you, I, I think I know most of you, but I, for those of you that I don't know, um, I, I uh, spent 24 years active. My last three were here on the Naval Academy grounds. I worked for the uh, superintendent as the director of special events with young Kate, who's running this, this, this day for us here. Um, I was teaching ethics, the third class midshipman, and uh, then when I retired, I came across to the Alumni Association. I still teach ethics. It's been eight years now. I teach ethics to third class midshipmen. Um, my wife and I have four kids. Two of them came here. One graduated in 13. One graduated in 17. Um, so from my perspective, I've been a member of a parents club. I've uh, been a member of many, many chapters. Um, I see Mark over there. A uh, member of the Half to Bridge chapter from Mark Ruprecht from back when he was a chapter president 15 years ago. Um, I'm part of my class board with Ingar, a class president here. So I've sat in a lot of your different roles and, and, and participated in a lot of the different activity along the way. Um, but, but I guess my, my, my most important message here is my team is, is fantastic. So Elizabeth Biedenbender, very quietly sitting back there, takes care of our parents' programs. She's a wonderful human being. We don't pay her nearly enough, but she takes care of a lot of our, our parents' programs. Joe Fagan is on an airplane right now going to uh, sunny Orlando, Florida, where we're gonna have a dinner down there tonight getting ready for the US UCF game. We have a reception there tonight. Holly Powers, I hope you're still here, running our class reunions and our class support. And then Noreen Frenet. Uh, Noreen has taken over six. So we're, as, we, as we're developing these shared interest groups, um, it's a wonderful group of people that are, that are out here to be your, um, your links back to us to try to get you the support that you need. Starting about three years ago, we were uh, taught, we've been building on this campaign while we were in the quiet phase. And uh, we keep talking about this reachability. What's a good number? What's a reachability number that we should be happy with? Um, and at the, around 2015, I took a snapshot of how many good email addresses we had in the system. And it was about 72%. Um, now West Point, when I shared that with our Joint Service Academy at our executive conference, they are like, that's fantastic. We're maybe 50% reachable. You guys are doing great. And then I went over to uh, our American Athletic Conference peers in you know, Houston, Central Florida, South Florida, and they said, we're like 22%. You guys are doing fantastic. So I thought 72 was probably a pretty good number, but maybe we could try to get a little bit better. Maybe we could squeak it out a little bit more. So over the last three years, with Murph's help, with the Council of Class Presidents, we've been able to push data back to the class presidents and say, Here's what I show. Your class is sitting at 62. Your class is sitting at, at 84. And we've driven that up to one too many. From 72 to 84%. Now what that difference there is 7,000 or so alumni are now engaged just in the past three years. So for those, for those of you that are in class leadership roles, if you want to keep driving that number up, I'm happy to tell you who we don't have a good email address on. I can tell you this afternoon if you'd like, and we don't have a good email address on And But using your other vehicles, your social media, your Snapchats and quick pics or whatever those, sounds like, sounds like a serial to me, but uh, 
if you can use whatever social media you can to engage them, we'll take the data and we'll populate it and we'll get it right. When we started the shared interest group with women, um, a group that we we didn't have great represent, we didn't have great data on. A lot of times their names are changing, they're bouncing around, their emails are changing. Uh, we started off with 97 women in our, our women's SIG, and within a year we had over a thousand. And then Barbette Lowndes sends me the data and says, Here, here's their contact information. Help us communicate with them. So we're then able to populate the data for them, and now we're communicating even better. I, I can tell you that this has got us prepared for the campaign, has got us prepared for this public phase, but we've already felt the results of it as we've been trying to get our database better. Um, on the road this year, we, uh, we went to Hawaii to lead off the, the season. The last time we were there, I guess six, seven years ago, we had 300, I think, the tailgate. This year we had 900. We went to, uh, Dallas is always big, but we had 1,200 at SMU, it was a rainy day. We went out to San Diego, there's 4,300 people at our tailgate in San Diego. It was a monster. So I know, the, I know the messaging is getting there, the event solutions are getting there. Now, now is the time that we just need to populate the information on how we're doing towards this campaign and what the next steps are. This data is gonna look a little disappointing, but I'm gonna show it to you anyway. So from our annual uh, giving report, that, uh, it's one of our, at our uh, documents that comes out of Shipmate. Um, I just posted the data, and this is the participation rate of our classes in getting back to the academy. Um, as Eric Grubman alluded to, we can do better. There's a lot of white space on this chart, and that will be our goal over the next two years. Try to get a little bit more blue and a little less white, right? But there is another really positive takeaway in this, and uh, John was talking about that a little earlier, with the 2008 group and, and younger. They get it. Um, I, uh, I had the 2008 guys here for a union this fall, and they had $360,000 to give back to the Naval Academy. And two thirds of that they gave to MAG, the Midshipman Activities Group, that does all of the community service. And then the other third they gave to the annual fund. It's pretty impressive for a young group out of 2008. 2013, John Rex Spivey, one of my sons is in that class. 81% of those kids participated. That might not have been a large gift, but they're in it, they understand. And when you ask them what's going on, they'll tell you, I owe. I owe back to my institution. I had opportunities to go abroad. I had a, a semester abroad, I had an exchange. I had this international immersion opportunity. I got a scholarship to Knowles. I had things given to me, I owe, I owe back. That's what these younger generations believe. And what we need to do is just try to help convey that to the rest of the chart and push that thing up there a little bit more below. As part of this regional campaign rollout, I know that there's area of the countries, areas in this country where we have lots of alumni, yet they're not participating in, in their chapters. We know that. I mean, we've talked to uh, Scott Bethman, we've talked to different groups where they're like, Help me get people back in here. I've got, where's Scott Beth? How many people, we got 1,300, 1300 alumni living in Jacksonville, and, and we gotta get people coming to his events. So it's, it's, it's my priority to try to help Scott get people as part of his, his chapter. And that's gonna be, this, that's what I think that we can do with this campaign, is use some of this energy, use some of this material, and uh, use some of this marketing to try to hold events in some of these areas where we have lots of alumni and get them back into the chapters where they can participate. So, what is the ask? What was the ask? Um, you are among very few who know what's going on here because you just got to witness it. You got to see the excitement of what our, our leaders are doing out there in industry, what our flag officers have accomplished as a result of their experience here, what our midshipmen are able to do, and, and, this, and the, the, the activities that they're involved in because of philanthropy, you just absorbed it. And to our people that are being, you know, watching me on film, I hope, as we pass this video back out there, you're gonna see these videos, you're gonna get caught up. You know what's going on out there. We need you to take that message back. 
If there's a parent club event near you, go participate. If you're a parent and there's a chapter event, go participate. If there's a SIG evolution, go participate. You know, because these things are coming on all around you, and we need more informed advocates to be participants in that. So when you know the old grumpy one sitting there, I don't know where that money's going, you can be there to help explain where that money's going. Because we have them. We have them in our own class. And I I love Scott Wine. You know, our, 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 uh, our, our class gift, we got the, hey, you're class of 89, I think you're probably going to hit 400000 for your class gift. Scott said, sure. Let me get my checkbook out. I'm like, wait a minute, Scott. I appreciate that you can do that, but we got to get our class involved. And, and Ingar is, is on, a, on a press to get our class participation rate up, because we don't want to live down there 20%. We want to be up there. We want to be up there at eighty-nine percent, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I listened over the last two days. I listened to this. I saw what happened in San Diego at the tailgate. I saw what at the tailgate, not at the president's circle. But I saw what happened in Dallas at the tailgate, not at the very small reception we had in the Dallas Country Club. Rogers. Where is the responsibility to ask? Right? It's one thing to be an advocate, it's one to be participating, but we have to ask. And presidents of these classes have to ask. And presidents of these chapters are going to have to ask. Otherwise, this won't work. You can't just be an advocate. Somebody has to ask. And frankly, every time we put that sign up, we ought to be asking at every deal, not just those selected events, because that's the difference between the quiet phase and the public phase. So I want to make sure we don't get out of here this week without recognizing we have to ask. Thank you, Walt Hanstein. That was wonderful. I appreciate that, sir. on track but but I will tell you that in, in a lot of cases in a lot of classes you have that one or two or three guys that can write that big check and then you have 800 that sit on the sidelines and hope the guy with the big checkbook can do it right we got it we got to get out of that mindset here for the next couple of years it's got to be we got to get all of our classmates off the bench and in the game right they got to be participating it doesn't have to be a lot it would be great if it was but we've got to get them in the game participating. They've got to have some ownership back to this institution. So one of the things Craig said to me, and I don't think any of you heard it, so I wanted to say it out loud. So that reachability number, our denominator that goes up, Craig said, so it's my fault that we're losing? And it absolutely is not. And the reason being is those additional people are now going to be those advocates that we need. They, and along that continuum, you, could, you don't give to an institution if you don't know anything about it. You don't give to an institution if you're not getting their emails or if you're not getting their story. And so the more connected they are there, first you have to make that connection to ask for, to, to make that ask. And all of you already have those connections, so we're asking you to go out and make additional connections and then make that ask. But we're not going to have you make that ask without giving you the tools to do so. Let's segue. That's exactly All right. So now we're going to segue into campaign box. Obviously, it's scalable to larger chapters and smaller chapters. Like and the boot chip dinner. Like the boot chip dinner. And we're going to be capturing this video along with the videos of what we've taken this weekend. We're going to capture it. We're going to put it on a thumb drive. We're going to put it in a box. And we're going to push things out to you. We're going to have the campaign profile, strategic priorities, so that you have a, a, a way of articulating what those pools of, of priority are still left and where the money goes. We're going to have briefing materials. We're going to have the campaign videos on there. We're going to have little bits of swag in there. So you have tabletops. We'll have 
ball caps, we'll have flags. We are going to make this hopefully easy enough for you to just hold an event, bring your box, and execute. Okay? I hope that makes sense. The reason we came up with this particular box and what's in it is we surveyed the chapter presidents because we thought it would be really important to find out what you wanted and what you needed. But the more feedback we get like that, we can add quite easily to the toolbox online. You could download those files and get them printed, absolutely. So we'll, we'll definitely add those because we already even have the files. And if you have any other additions or questions, um, we'll definitely consider them. Are you sending that to uh, the parent club as well parent as the Yeah, so the way it'll work is there is a, well, there's a flyer down here, and all of you are encouraged to take it. You can also get it online. And it tells you how to order a campaign in a box. So it'll, t it'll talk about when the event is, how many people, what you're expecting, and we'll customize it and work with you. So this is new to us, so give us a little time to, to get really comfortable with it. We're, we're really hoping for a couple of guinea pigs first. We talked about it at a meeting next week, and we think we're going to give this box right away, too, so you can take it back and let us know how it goes. So on this page, and the website is on the back of this flyer. You get, get to it from the new, new site. So what they have here are the downloadable logos and banners, so web banners for emails, that sort of a thing. There are event support, so you can download name tags to print. You can have additional table tents if you want to customize them. And there are uh, digital resources, so a number of images, campaign-themed images that we had shot just for this campaign. You probably saw a lot of them last night. And um, the 15-second, the 30-second, and next week the 7-minute video will be up there. So that's already up there, and you can use it today. Any other questions? Yes. Is there a donate here link rather than go to USA.com? Is there an actual link to pay? On every single page you can get. Every single page has a give. Yep. Absolutely. Good question. We've heard about that a few times. Well, it's interesting. Somebody said, are you going to do a campaign website? We're like, no, we're going to do a website because it's one effort. It's one time. We're all in with it. Right. Seven and a half and older. The IRA rollover is one of the greatest opportunities for giving. Um, it's easy to do. Keisha Watkins is our contact for doing that. If you make a gift like that, let us know. Please send an email so we can credit you for your gift. I will the companies let us know about that. And then talk to Gary Anderson. Gary is now a big advocate for folks setting up charitable gift annuities, another great way to maximize tax benefits and provide for yourself and the academy. And I'm happy to come out and talk chapters about smart, tax-wise ways to give and partic participate in the campaign. Uh, long and short, if you're under 70, you can give until it hurts and you'll get a tax deduction for it. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Any other Craig, 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 for donations, um, are you, are you able to designate it as uh, you donated at a chapter event or something like that so the chapters get feedback or the classes get feedback on because it, we are the success of the events that we have? The donation is going to be made by an individual and it's the class is going to feel the, the effect of it, especially if it goes towards the class gift and the annual fund. But from a chapter perspective, I don't know that you would know that data. What I would say it's very easy that if there was some kind of a formal gathering set and part of the message was we'd like you to contribute, it would be very easy for us to just track who attended that event and what came in as a result and share that. So it's not something as a matter of course we do, but it would be very easy to do in, in any instance like that. But I appreciate where you're going with that. <laughs> Right. Absolutely. It is. It's very easy to do. <laughs> All right, good. We'll be informed advocates and get out there and fight the football for us. We've got a little, little bit of ways to go here, but I appreciate your day here today, and I think that concludes our portion of the, of the weekend. We'll stay around here and answer any questions you might have one-on-one, -on -one, but for the rest of you, thank you, and have a wonderful day. Stay dry out there.